Well, I've been asked to give you an introduction and presentation of uh, FLEC, and uh, I'm glad to, to do this today. Uh, here's an outline of my presentation. First of all, um, I will walk you through the uh, outset, uh, explain you why we derived that, uh, the conclusion that we had to build a, a marketplace for flexibility. And, and then in the second half, I will explain you what FLEC is about in further detail. At the end of my presentation, you will find a reference list where you can find the literature that we have been producing uh, working on, on this. I, I don't want to go in details with this. You can read it afterwards. OK, so to the introduction here. Um, it's nice to f know um, where you are heading. And in order to understand where you're heading, it's also nice to know where you're coming from. So therefore, I would like to start with this slide. And as uh, those of you who were here yesterday uh, saw Morten Beck, um, he's, he showed a nice slide here from the 70s uh, showing car-free Sundays. Um, this was the period here um, where we actually were busy trying to uh, make a transition from um, oil to coal in the 80s. Um, we became champions in uh, uh, actually optimizing uh, CHPs. Um, I, if I dig my memory, I think I've seen a, a slide showing that uh, if you take a top 20 of the most efficient uh, plants in the world, you'll find more or less all the Danish plants here. Then during the 90s, um, we became busy trying to integrate wind power. And in the zeros, we were busy doing liberalization unbundling of the energy sector. And now here in the teens, uh, we have focus on this green and flexible energy, smart grid, smart energy. So we have inherited from this process here, we have inherited a system which is looking like this. Um, if we say we have uh, the power generation up here, then you can see that the power is flowing into the transmission system, down to the distribution system, and eventually down to the customers. So we have the transmission system, which is um, voltages above 100 kilowatt. And uh, down here, uh, at the distribution, we have uh, below 100 kilowatt. And we have a lot of uh, DSOs down here. In Denmark, the last time I looked, we had about 64. So this is a lot of uh, smaller companies down here. So the main part here is you could call this our infrastructure. And they, uh, it is taken care of by uh, two kinds of entities the transmission system operator and the DSOs here. So this is, um, this is a monopoly. And if we move on, then we could take a look at the commercial side. Um, we, we have the balance responsibles, wholesalers and retailers on the consumption side. On the generation side, it's more simple. Uh, these uh, actors or players have been merged together. So it's most interesting, also from a demand load uh, point of view, to look on the consumption side. These um, uh, entities here have the, um, some roles in the market setup. Um, the BRPs and wholesalers mostly are, are joined together now. Uh, and uh, you, ha you have to be a BRP if you want to make um, trade on, on the energy exchange markets. Uh, or if you want to make trades with the ancillary service markets with the TSO as uh, operator. So this, this setup here is that the BRP and wholesaler, they are buying energy from the energy exchange uh, uh, on behalf of the retailers, and the retailers are then selling this to the customers. Um, and uh, as the uh, setup is today, if you are a customer down here, you can choose whichever retailer you like the most. Um, this is very nice, and this is non-flexible load. So how do we deal with a uh, flexible load? Well, today, uh, actually, it's uh, taken care of uh, in exa exactly the same way as um, non-flexible load. We don't use it. Um, so we can make two observations from this drawing, that uh, the retailers and uh, the BRPs, they have no incentives, actually, to take benefit of the flexibility down here. And you can also see from this drawing that the DSO is absent um, for various reasons. Um, and uh, let's dwell a bit about uh, drivers and challenges for the DSOs here. 
the DSO uh, have the highest, they have this obligation, the highest possible uh, supply uh, security, and they have to do it at the lowest price. Um, actually, David uh, went into some of the challenges that uh, the DSO have. Um, it's increased power consumption, um, and this could be due to heat pumps, EVs, batteries, and this. And they also have this increased um, share of uh, a distributed um, generation, like uh, PV, uh, microwind. We haven't seen that much, but uh, micro CHPs could still come on, on, on the page. So on this slide here, I try to enumerate a number of solutions that we have to, uh, that we can use for, for working with these challenges. And um, we have the conventional solution here, which is grid reinforcement. That is the normal drill of the DSOs. Uh, very soon we will have tariffs, which could be of help to deal with uh, these evening peak hours. But uh, uh, to my opinion, it's not a solution. If people want to, t to use energy here, they will simply do it. Uh, and then we have the uh, smart grid solution, which is about, uh, in this content context, um, mobilizing flexibility, and that could either be through uh, regulatory, regulatory demands or grid codes, or it could be market-driven. If we jump to the TSO side, then um, we find some other uh, objectives here. They have to uh, ensure the highest possible power supply security on both uh, gas and power, and uh, they are also the driver of uh, the political targets uh, regarding change towards uh, this fossil-free generation, and they have to do it in a social, economic, efficient way. Um, so, of course, then the TSO more or less has the same challenges uh, as the DSO, uh, but they also have it um, uh, more related on an energy level. And due to these political targets, um, they have the challenges of uh, they need to develop new markets and services. And I would say they are also uh, responsible for driving the smart grid. So uh, for this, we also could put up a number of conventional solutions. Of course, we have the grid reinforcement. Um, uh, the TSOs really like the idea of having uh, interconnectors so they can export the challenges to the neighbors. And um, we have, of course, the uh, smart grid here where we again have um, the regulatory uh, demands and we have the market-driven approach. Um, I want to make a small point here that the uh, grid codes, uh, I'm actually in favor of grid codes, um, but not necessarily on the smart grid side, uh, just to put it on the edge it wouldn't make sense to demand from a coffee machine to be very smart. Uh, that would make coffee machines quite expensive. But uh, uh, with uh, uh, things that has uh, higher flexibility, that could make sense. So um, if we go here and try to look at the iPower angle, um, actually, in I'm from uh, Work Package 4, and um, we have an Work Package 4 had the obligation of uh, developing a, a simulation platform where we could take all the nice things uh, we could dream of, uh, of such a smart grid scenario, put it into the tool, and simulate it. Um, in this work, it very fast became clear that we needed a, a, a good place to trade our flexibility. And um, this, um, these challenges I took to the, our um, work package leader group, and uh, we start, started to discuss it. Um, and we found out that uh, actually, if you read our proposal, um, it doesn't really say much about how we should uh, and what we should end up with. So we set down a fast working task force, uh, and we came up with a white paper where we actually defined what do we want to get out of the iPower project. Um, and I just sampled uh, um, two lines here from our mission statement that it is about developing and utilizing flexible consumption and production solutions which offer new possibilities for optimal handling of uh, distribution grids, so mainly on the DSO level. Um, and they, uh, these are market uh, solutions ensuring an efficient uh, also energy system. So these are nice high-level uh, uh, goals to pursue. 
Um, so with this uh, uh, backup, we could continue our work with pursuing a, a market framework. And uh, we have looked at uh, bilateral contracts, auctions, stock markets, um, trying to figure out how can we make a connection between aggregators and TSOs. Um, we also set down that um, um, the TSOs and, and the DSOs, they should not be the ones who uh, operate price signals. And um, uh, it does because they are monopoly, but it could be nice uh, if the aggregators had this possibility. So whether they go for direct or indirect control, that is um, a business case uh, for the aggregator to decide on. So in this way, we have covered, um, hopefully, most of the, the scenarios. OK, uh, now I have tried to set the scene and why we have been dealing with uh, this market uh, stuff in iPower. So now it's time to tell you about this uh, flex stuff, the flexibility clearing house, which is this nice uh, framework for trading flexibility. Um, so let's jump back to the market side <coughs> and uh, look on how, how can we integrate such a new thing in the market. Well, this is uh, my favorite um, architecture, you could call it, where we have the aggregator down here. Actually, there's a quite big number of ways that you could structure this, but uh, to my opinion, uh, this layout here has the highest uh, degree of freedom to go to various solutions. So we have the aggregator here. The aggregator will, um, will do the aggregation of the, flexible, um, of the flexibility here, and the aggregator can offer this to the flex uh, market. And you see up here we have the DSOs and TSOs, who are the ones who request this flexibility. Um, then the aggregator here in this setup could also provide flexibility to the wholesalers or BRPs if they have imbalances, if they can see in their setup that they have imbalances, or the aggregator could make a deal with the BRP that some of the, this flexibility could actually be offered to the ancillary service markets. So we try to cover the whole uh, range. So both dedicated what I would call flexibility services, but we also want to serve the original world. Um, then I have written here, we have a number of services, and we want to, with the flag, be quite flexible. So if um, the oh, DSOs or TSOs um, obtain a new um, a desire or request for flexibility, we should be able to quite easily make a service for this. That's an important part here. That's a possibility which you don't have over here, because um, the tendency here is that this will be more and more internationalized or standardized. So these, uh, the old markets here are quite rigid. There's another, another challenge here that we have, which is a favor of, uh, of the flag. If you are an aggregator or a DER, it's, it's a challenge to just forecast one day ahead. If, uh, if you want to make uh, delivery services for the secondary uh, reserve here, you must be able to do this one month ahead, and that is, that is close to impossible for, for these kind of resources. So with the flag here, we have targeted a very short uh, forecast schedule, and this is, a, uh, is to be built into the uh, services. Before I dig down and, and walk you through the flag solution, um, I just want to put your mind in the right direction. So what we do here uh, traditionally, when we talk about uh, power, we're doing planning by forecasting, we're doing scheduling by dispatching plans, we're doing operation, we execute our plans, and we're supervised that they're doing as supposed to, and uh, of course, by the end of the day, we're doing settling. Um, another slide that, that I have to present to you before we, we dig into to flag is that when we talk about these uh, energy markets, uh, we have an operational phase, before the operational phase, we have a market phase. So this is the Elspot. It's running on a daily basis. If we dig one, dig deeper, then you will see that uh, this uh, Elspot has been divided into 24-hour markets. So we have uh, 24 LBAS markets. It's important for me to convey this idea that actually we are dealing with uh, markets that are operated on various timescales. Uh, this one 
you could actually go one dig deeper and then you would have what is called the regulating power market where we have um, a final resolution again. <clears throat> so try to keep in mind that we are operating on different time scales. Um, and uh, then after the operational uh, time, then we have the balancing power market where we clean up all the unbalances and, and send the bills to the right ones who, who, uh, did, the, who did not deliver the services. Okay, now we are ready. You can see the coloring here is from uh, the same as uh, with this traditional uh, um, decomposition. So we have the planning, planning, scheduling, and operation and settlement. If I take the TSO or the DSO here, uh, doesn't matter, it's pretty much the same that they're doing. Then uh, I would say in the control room, what they do is to generate load profiles. They try to estimate the grid flow and uh, on this behalf, they derive on some request for flexibility. If you are a DSO today, the only thing you can do here is um, to uh, dig more copper in the ground. But if we assume uh, that the also the DSOs have the capabilities of going out to um, flexibility providers, well, then they could make a request. And uh, here the aggregator uh, hopefully is ready. They have the same setup here that they are forecasting their flexibility. Um, they are doing aggregation and they optimize the flexibility. And if they can see that they ha have surplus um, flexibility, uh, then of course they will make a bid to the um, system side. Now that the system side has achieved uh, some new um, possibilities, they can start to plan it into their um, um, schedules. And uh, of course then they, they will do contracts uh, with the aggregators. Um, now we come to this point that you must remember that this is taking place on this different uh, time scale. So this is the, sorry, the idea of uh, having these markets operating on different scales. And what we have uh, designed here is actually one of the products that we have been looking on here uh, is a DSO product that would work on uh, several months scale and uh, other products would come down to maybe our scale. So, so these uh, things are working together and, and uh, in they are interlinked. Now, we have uh, made the contracting. Now we can enter the operational hour and we can have our activations. And of course, the aggregators will provide uh, according to contract. And by the end of the day, we do the payment. So this is very simple what Flick is about. No big deal. We'll have a market phase, and we will have a bookkeeping, um, supervision, and payment. And yeah, you could say that's not a big deal. But the, the setup here is very much targeted on, on uh, flexibility, on the DERs that are out in the landscape. So uh, if we go to the uh, more design side, uh, we could look and see what kind of new fun functionalities do we need for, for doing this. Well, uh, since Flag is a new thing, we need to be build uh, interfaces, uh, market clearing, uh, and, uh, market and clearing stuff, contracting, contract supervision, and settlement. On the aggregator side, um, I would say they are mature. They hopefully know what they're doing, so they would have flexibility assist assessment tools. They also have assessment tools for their financial setup, so they know what flexibility they can provide at which price for the system. What they need to build is a flex um, uh, interface. If we jump to the DSO side, well, this is new stuff for the DSO, so they would have to go in and understand the flexibility that they have in the system. They would need some assessment tools, it's also a matter of understanding a new business case. It's not digging copper into the ground. It's uh, deferred uh, uh, investments. So if they can make a better business case uh, by buying flexibility compared to uh, put copper into the ground, well, then it should be beneficial for them to go this way. On the TSO side, uh, they are already masters in the ancillary services, so they know they have the tools here. They would need a flag interface. And, and then, in principle, we are up running. Um, I promised you to look at uh, our prototypes uh, and show you how far we are. Here, um, we have the five products that David talked about. And uh, we have actually developed uh, three of them. 
Um, and we have also here very lately developed a GSO uh, service, which we call uh, Fast Frequency uh, Reserve. Um, we today had the idea that we wanted to uh, uh, demonstrate this power cap. Um, the plan here was to have a, actually a full business case from our DSO down to a greenhouse and do this as close as if uh, FLEC actually was um, uh, in the market. Um, unfortunately, our DSO had to jump out of, out of uh, this uh, deal uh, due to the coming uh, tariffs. They faced the problem that <laughs> due to this tariff um, they could risk pushing um, the greenhouse into a more expensive hour and should they then reimburse the extra cost that they had because they should have uh, the flexibility. Um, and if they gave this uh, benefit to this customer, then in, uh, they, they would have to give it to all others. So by they, they jumped out, it was too complicated. So one smart grid initiative uh, uh, shut, shut down another one. Um, so we stopped this one and we went into the power max and this is what you will see this um, afternoon. Um, so we have implemented the power cut plant and we have implemented the power max. There was a question down here about uh, how we did the priority. Uh, actually, the power cut plant uh, we discussed with our own TSO, uh, sorry, DSO, and um, they, they were giving the possibility which of these would you like to have the first, and they chose the power cut. Um, but as I said, today we'll see um, this, the power max. Uh, just stepping back to April, um, this power cut on an IT level, we, we did a demonstration at IBM, and we showed how um, the power cut plant uh, is, is working, and, and by this we demonstrated the, the IT setup. Um, today we'll see real live demos with the uh, power max, and it's going to be interesting when you enter reality. Um, David also push, uh, touched upon this. Uh, what PowerMax is about is that uh, the DSO has forecasted a peak loan. What to do about it? We believe that we have flexibility, so the DSO goes into Flick and buys um, the service from aggregators having stuff out in the grid where they have the problem. So it's time to wrap up. I hope I have uh, convinced you that the uh, FLEC is a parallel marketplace, um, which fits actually quite well into the existing world. We don't have to make a lot of dif differences to make this running. Um, we can ac accommodate uh, flexibility services from these DERs, uh, and, and right now it's based on the re requests from TSOs and DSOs. But actually, it would be quite simple for us um, to also target the BRPs if they would like to, to buy this flexibility or they could be granted the possibility to put offers or request themselves. Um, and as we have seen a couple of times here, the aggregator is an emerging business. It's not so theoretical anymore. They do exist. Uh, we had one yesterday, David Hill from Open Energy um, presenting. Dong Energy has uh, the power hub, and um, I also am sure that uh, Matthias could enumerate a number of German um, uh, aggregators. Hmm? So the downsides here, I'll move so you can see it. The downsides, it's not all glamorous. Um, we need to find an aggregator who would go in and take the operational um, obligations of, uh, of operating flag. Uh, as we heard also from David, currently we don't have any uh, burning platform, um, but um, <coughs> that could very easily um, uh, arise again, uh, depending on the funny ideas from our politicians. Uh, if they treat it uh, the right way, uh, then we get another boom, and uh, then uh, flag could be interesting to have in place. So uh, I would say right now we are doing, like Mask McKinney says, um, Hmm. Who can uh, translate that? <laughs> we want to be in place with the tools before the shit happens. <laughs> um, 
And there's another, uh, David also talked about um, uh, obstacles that right now, uh, how the DSO uh, um, uh, benchmarked, um, they are actually only benchmarked by uh, their assets and not by operational matters. So actually it would be a bad idea for them if they wanted to, to go for buying operational flexibility. Uh, it would be a minus on and, and, uh, and their um, benchmarking. Final remarks? Well, in uh, work package before, we have been working with uh, making prototypes of flag for services. Um, we have um, uh, specified and designed this, and this has been documented. Uh, we have um, a number of, we have two services uh, implemented already, and um, uh, the first TSO service is, uh, I would say, more or less ready for implementation. I need to write the final words in the report, and then it will also be available. Um, on the demonstration side, um, yeah, we have demonstrated the IT solution uh, in April. Um, today, we are uh, making another attempt to do demonstration, and maybe at our workshop in November, maybe we could have a TSO, you never know, demonstration, but I would work actively uh, pushing this direction. And then, final takeaways. More and more flexibility enters the system, and we need to have focus uh, to have this flexibility made controllable. Otherwise, we just have more and more non-controllable stuff, and this is not what we want. Flexibility can be traded. Um, we need just a, a dedicated market. Uh, the old markets are not that fit for, for flexibility. Um, and I would say, uh, but I'm a bit colored, Flex is a promising solution. Um, we just need to find this operator. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Lars. Very interesting. Um, since we have a flag demonstration this afternoon with Esteban and Anas, I suggest that uh, the more technical questions for flag will be waiting until the afternoon. I suppose you'll be here also. Unless oh. there's a single question for for, for last year, I suggest that coffee is on the, on the table, <laughs> and uh, we'll be back here at a quarter past eleven. But 